Good morning and welcome to Northwest, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. We're glad you're here today. My name is Diana Kohler. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the worship, worship associate this morning. Today's service, which our interim minister, the Reverend Kevin DeBeck, will lead, explores the role of humanism in Unitarian Universalism for the past 100 years and discusses how it can help us understand the time we live in and be more exclusive. Our music today will be provided by the Northwest Singers, led by Ken Hermanot and our pianist, Alex uh, Myers. Mohsen Azerbaijani is the Zoom host. The lovely prelude, which Alex just played, is the Ukrainian National Anthem. If you are a visitor here and would like us to stay in touch with you, please fill out the visitor form that you will see in the chat box. Please note that the chat feature has been disabled except for chatting directly with the Zoom host. If you uh, are having, with the tech host, if you're having problems with Zoom, please use the chat function or the raise hand function in Zoom. We encourage you to add your pronouns by clicking on the participants button at the top of the Zoom window. Next, hover your mouse over the name, your name in the participants list on the right side of the Zoom window and then click on rename. We plan to reopen for worship services uh, in person next Sunday. Everyone uh, participating in person needs to be vaccinated and to wear a mask. We continue to offer those uh, opportunities for online participation. Next Sunday service will commemorate two years since the start of the uh, pandemic and all the losses we have experienced during that time. The following week is our Pledge Sunday. Shine Your Light is our theme for this year. This evening at 6, 6 to 8 p.m., we can join the Empowerment Church for a program on slavery, slavery and the Underground Railroad in Detroit. Empowerment is one of our neighboring churches. This Tuesday at six o'clock, we're having a vigil for Ukraine. At this point, it will be virtual. If there is a strong desire for something in person, we will add that element as well. This is your opportunity to nominate an organization for our shared plate. Six times a year, we share with the City of Southfield's Human Services Department, helping our local neighbors and four times a year we have openings. So if you have an organization that you think does amazing work, please submit it to Jennifer Russell by Sunday, March 20th. Our RE program will include affinity groups and we need volunteers to run those groups. It takes about 20 to 25 minutes after the story time during the worship service. And there is a survey available to find out who wants to lead what kind of groups. We have a peace camp coming this summer for our youth and those in the neighborhood and beyond. It will run Monday, August 1st through Thursday, August 4th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And Eva will have details and registration soon. Our Board of Governors is sponsoring a congregational congregation conversation next Sunday after the service. And the March board meeting will take place Thursday the 10th at seven o'clock via Zoom. And now we have some videos. Hello, my name is Anel Eccleston and I'm the Director of Care and Sustainability at the Student Advocacy Center. Student Advocacy Center believes education is a human right and every youth is worthy of a quality education. Every day, we work to help Michigan students, K through 12, get back in school, stay in school, and grow in spaces where they feel safe, loved, heard, and challenged. 
At the Student Advocacy Center, we are composed of social workers and teachers who are passionate for ensuring all students have the opportunity to be supported in completing school. We work collaboratively with underserved students and their families to stay in school, realize their rights to a quality public education, grow and experience success. We have offices in Detroit, Ypsilanti and Jackson. Did you know that every school day more than six children are expelled from Michigan schools? Our school systems are in an educational crisis where suspensions, expulsions and school-based arrests are used far too often in Michigan schools. We are there for those families, even when no one else is. We have our Check and Connect program, which is an evidence-based two-year mentoring program from the University of Minnesota. Our mentors develop long-term relationships with a focus on school engagement. We have our education advocacy program, where advocates are supporting students by averting expulsions, reducing suspensions, and ensuring students' rights are upheld. We also support Michigan families with our statewide helpline. Our mentors and advocates help a wide variety of students find success, including students with disabilities, youth in foster care or experiencing homelessness, students facing harsh school discipline, or students who may be court involved. And we really work with our families to create systems level changes. We will continue to fight for the rights of all students, and we are excited that you are willing to invest in our children today. Thank you. Dear Northwest member and friends, the 2022 Canvas Committee, which was responsible for securing 75% of the church's annual operating budget, is inviting you to two important upcoming events. Food and fun are real possibilities. Have we got your attention? First, on Friday, March 11th, at seven o'clock, we have our Night of Talent. This special Zoom event will showcase many of our members. Think of it like a coffee house on caffeine. Everything from Israeli dancing to Persian singing, from bubbles to tubas. And we have a special guest appearance that you will not want to miss. So mark your calendars now for the evening of March 11th and watch for our special invitation and link for this wonderful event. Second, on Sunday, March 13th at 10.30 a.m., we will kick off our pledge drive. This annual event provides you the opportunity to fund the mission of the church. You'll be able to make your pledge online or in person, whichever is more convenient. During the service, you will learn how important your support is for the future of our church. Following up with 120 people is a daunting task. So we ask you to please make your pledge within one week of March 13th. As a small token of our appreciation to those who pledge by March 19th, we will be drawing names for four gift cards of $50 to Buddy's Pizza. Yes, that's right. You can treat the whole family to a Detroit tradition just by pledging quickly. The 2022 Canvas Committee wants each and every one of you to know that your participation in the life of the church and in our annual pledge drive is really appreciated. You have our gratitude and respect. Please join us on March 11th and March 13th. You won't regret it and we won't forget it. And lastly, if you have any questions about the upcoming pledge, please don't hesitate to reach out to Martha Spear or to me, Beata Lamparski. We are the co-chairs this year of the Pledge Drive, and we'll be happy to help you. Now, please sit back and enjoy a preview of our upcoming talent show. Hit it, Mosin.
Good morning, everyone. My name is the Reverend Kevin DeBeck. My pronouns are he, him, and his. And uh, usually at this point of the service, we do a regular sort of chalice lighting that kind of brings everybody in. But today, in, re, uh, in reflection of recent events going on in Eastern Europe, this morning I wish to offer a prayer. And before I do that, I want to light a special candle for Ukraine. This prayer this morning comes uh, from my friend and colleague, the Reverend Jen Grayson, and she says, Spirit of life and love, our hearts are aching today as we watch fear and terror being inflicted on Ukraine. We pray from afar, seeing people flee in fear, praying in the streets, gripped by an uncertainty that echoes in our hearts. We have known uncertainty and fear these last two years. And while we are aware it is nothing like war, we are reminded of our tie to the humanity of those we have never known. We pray, we pray for the parents trying to protect their children. We ache for children as forces outside their control shatter their world. We ache for those doing what they can to flee the movements of nations. And we pray for those who cannot flee May the world not turn its face away from this pain, even in those moments when we, as individuals, must rest our spirits. May our thoughts and prayers become actions that end war and the threat of war forever. Our opening words are Thresholds by Arlen Goff. Thresholds, we cross them every day, from room to room, from outside to inside and back again, from here to there, from anywhere to everywhere, from age to age. Each threshold offers an opportunity for change, for renewal, for transformation from what we were and what we are to what we can be in this hour and in this place we crossed a threshold from our day-to-day -day everydayness into time and space attuned to the other to the sacred to the holy into an awareness of new life pregnant with possibilities how will we be renewed in this moment? How will we be changed in this hour? How will we be transformed through this gathering of beloved community? Come, you longing, thirsty souls. Come, let us worship together. This morning, we have a Canvas testimonial from Bob Holly. I have found the Northwest Unitarian Church to be a home for me. I am proud to be a member of the congregation that accepts me even though I am an atheist. While I have no desire to convert anyone else to my viewpoint, I also expect others to accept me for what I am. This has occurred here. I have even been asked to give a sermon on why I'm an atheist and so I wish to encourage everyone to support this congregation. Our first hymn this morning is number 293, O Star of Truth.
Our story today is called Emmanuel's Dream, and it's a true story of Emmanuel Afosu Yeboa. And it's by Lori Ann Thompson and Sean Qualls. In Ghana, West Africa, a baby was born. Two bright eyes blinked in the light. Two healthy halungs let out a powerful cry. Two tiny fists opened and closed, but only one strong leg kicked. Most people thought he would be useless or worse, a curse. His father left never to return, but his mother had faith. Her name was Comfort, and she named her first child Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. As Emmanuel grew, Mama Comfort told him he could have anything, but he would have to get it for himself. He learned to crawl and hop to fetch water and climb coconut trees. He even shined shoes to earn money. Most kids with disabilities couldn't go to school. Still, Emmanuel's mother carried him there until one day she said, you are too heavy. From then on, Emmanuel hopped to school and back, two miles each way, on one leg by himself. At first, nobody would, pl would play with him, so Emmanuel saved his money and bought something none of his classmates had, a brand new soccer ball. Of course, he would share it, if he could play too. Lunging and spinning on crutches his grandmother had found for him and kicking the ball with his good left foot, Emmanuel earned their respect. His new friends sometimes used their, their lunch money to rent bikes. Would Emmanuel be able to join them? His friend Godwin pushed him fast so he could balance. Over and over, Emmanuel fell hard, but finally he rode. When Emmanuel was 13, Mama Comfort got very sick. She could no longer sell vegetables at the market and Emmanuel's sister and brother were too little to work. He would have to support them, and against his mother's wishes, Emmanuel snuck out and boarded a midnight train to the bustling city of Accra, 150 miles away, alone. He didn't know it, it then, but it would be two years before he saw his family again. Emmanuel arrived full of hope, there were so many people, but no one would hire him. Shopkeepers and restaurant owners told him to go out and beg, like other disabled people did. Emmanuel refused. Finally, a, f a food stand owner offered him a job and a place to live. Emmanuel wasn't serving drinks. He, when Emmanuel wasn't serving drinks, he kept busy shining shoes. He earned money and sent it home. One morning when Emmanuel went to buy shoe shining supplies, the shopkeeper thought he was there to beg and scolded him. Insulted, Emmanuel slammed his money down on the counter. The shopkeeper apologized, but Emmanuel would never forget. When Mama Comfort grew sicker, Emmanuel went home to be with her. From her bed on Christmas Eve, she told her son, be respectful, take care of your family, don't ever beg, and don't ever give up. By the next morning, Emmanuel's beloved mother was dead. He was heartbroken, but he knew her last words had been a gift. He would honor them by showing everyone that being disabled doesn't mean being unable. It was a big dream, but Emmanuel had a plan. Emmanuel had a sharp mind, a bold heart, and a one strong leg and he needed a bike. At first, no one would help. They thought his plan to bicycle around Ghana was impossible. Then Emmanuel wrote, wrote to the Challenged Athletics Associate, or Foundation all the way in San Diego, California. They sent him a bike, plus a helmet, shorts, socks, and gloves. Emmanuel started training for the long ride. 
he persuaded the king of the region to give him a royal blessing. He went door to door asking for additional support. And finally, he hired a taxi to follow him with drinking water, a camera, and his, first, and his best friends. Emmanuel tied his right leg to the bike's frame, jammed his left foot into a flip-flop, attached to the pedal, and rode. Emmanuel pedaled through the bustling city of Accra. He pedaled through rainforests over rolling hills, across wide, muddy rivers. He pedaled past Odom forests and plantain farms and through the city of Kumasi. He pedaled as trucks roared past in the narrow highways and, he, his, and wild animals stalked his thoughts. He pedaled through fast grasslands and into the ancient city of Tamale. He rode up, down, across, and around his country, proudly wearing the colors of his flag, and of its flag, and a shirt printed with the words, the pozo, or the disabled person. Along the way, Emmanuel talked to those with physical challenges and those without, to poor farmer workers and wealthy landowners, to religious leaders, government officials, and reporters. He wanted everyone to see him and his disability. He wanted everyone to hear him and his message. The, father, the farther Emmanuel rode, the more attention he got. Children cheered, able-bodied adults ran or rode along with him. People with disabilities left their homes and came outside, some for the very first time. The young man once thought of as cursed was becoming a national hero. He completed his astounding journey, pedaling south to the sea and back to Accra, nearly 400 miles in just 10 days. But Emmanuel's success goes even further than that. He proved that one leg is enough to do great things, and one person is enough to change the world. And now our hymn is 1008, When Our Heart Is In a Holy Place.
The reading I have this morning is from the opening paragraph of the Humanist Manifesto originally, and this is the first one, there are three versions, but this is the first one that was written and signed in 1933. And it says, or it states, <clears throat> the time has come for widespread recognition of the radical changes in religious beliefs throughout the modern world. The time has passed for mere revision of traditional attitudes. <clears throat> Science and economic change have disrupted the old beliefs. Religions the world over are under the necessity of coming to terms with new conditions created by a vastly increased knowledge and experience. In every field of human activity, the vital movement is now in the direction of a candid and explicit humanism. In order that religious humanism may be better understood, we, the undersigned, desire to make certain affirmations which we believe the facts of our contemporary life demonstrate. And before I go into my sermon, I want to kind of give a little historical footnote that one of the signers of that document was Unitarian Minister Lester Mondale. At the time, in 1933, he was serving the Unitarian Church in Evanston, Illinois, which is where I did my internship. So I feel a certain kinship with him. Uh, Lester Mondale, and he also served the Birmingham Church, which isn't that far from here. Uh, Lester Mondale was the only person who signed it when it was revised two other times, one in 1973 and one in 2003. He was the only original signer that signed all three documents. And, of course, he was the older half-brother of the vice president under Jimmy Carter and the 1984 Democratic national nominee, Walter Mondale. So where does one start a discussion on humanism and its influence on us as a religion and as, uh, on us as a popular culture? So I came across this sermon on UUA Worship Web, which was written by the Reverend Dr. Bruce Clear, and he also wrote a sermon about humanism, and, and here's how he started his, and these are his words. I've come to discover that what most people know about humanism, they learn from the lips of Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, and other televangelists. It is a shame that this is so, but it is. One key leader of the relig religious right, Tim LaHaye, and I also want to say, this is the guy that wrote all the Left Behind books that Kirk Cameron likes to star in, wrote an immensely popular book years ago about humanism that has probably been read by more people in this country than the works of humanist writers Bertrand Russell and John Dewey put together. Let me share with you with what, lo what lots of people know or think they know about humanism as explained by LaHaye in his popular book entitled The Battle for the Mind. And a few excerpts will do. <clears throat> humanism is not only the world's greatest evil, but until recently the most deceptive of all religious philosophies. They are committed to doing away with every vestige of the responsible moral behavior that distinguishes man from animals. Humanist politicians permitted Russia to conquer the satellite countries of Europe and turn them into socialist prisons. Humanist politicians prevented us from winning in Korea and Vietnam, and they voted to give away the Panama Canal. No humanist is qualified to hold any governmental office in America, United States Senator, Congressman, Cabinet Member, State Department employee, or any other position that requires him to think in the best interest of America. Humanists work untiringly to keep parents from injecting any moral ideals into their children. Believe it or not, their goal is a worldwide generation of young people with, com with a completely amoral or animal mentality. The incidence of assaults has doubled in the last decade. An incredible increase of promiscuity, premarital sex, trial marriages, abortions, and so forth have soiled the social fabric. These immoral expressions of amorality can be laid right at the door of atheistic, amoral humanism that permeates our country. Wow, did any of you know humanism was so powerful? I sure didn't. <clears throat> So let's go back to what a realistic definition of what humanism is. According to the Oxford Dictionary, the definition of humanism is an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. 
Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, em em emphasize common human needs, and seek solely rational ways of solving human problems. Now, that doesn't sound so horrible, does it? Now, of course, there are different flavors of humanism, such as secular humanism, in which there is nothing supernatural and everything in nature is explainable. Christian humanism, which states that Christian faith and rational inquiry are not mutually exclusive. I'm guessing Mr. LaHaye probably doesn't agree with that sentiment. And then there's my kind of humanism, religious humanism, which integrates humanistic ideals with religious rituals. And the best way that I describe my theology is that I believe that we humans are the authors of our own salvation, but we are also in need of rituals to help make meaning of our existence while we are here on this planet. Now, some of you may have other definitions, but these are the ones I'm going with. Now, the passage that I read to you all was the opening paragraph of the Humanist Manifesto, which was written in 1933. In that passage, they mention the term religious humanism because at that time, those that signed it felt that humanism would be a religion all unto itself. Now, of course, that didn't really come to pass. But I think religious humanism has a lot to offer that gives us a vision of a better future where perhaps some of the ills of society that plague us can be solved. Now, perhaps some of you are thinking, with climate change running rampant, fascists knocking on our proverbial door and civil rights being taken away, and with oligarchs working to make authoritarianism the lay of the political landscape, how can anybody be optimistic about the future? I would say that without an idea that we can work to make this kind of future we want for ourselves and our children, then we run the risk of becoming nihilists with no hope, and I can't live without hope. I just can't. I don't think many of us can. And what is it about humanism that gives us hope? I think of something that one of the greatest science fiction writers of the 20th century once said. Isaac Asimov, who was awarded the Humanist of the Year in 1984 and, oh, by the American Humanist Association, and he was also president of that organization from 1985 until his death in 1992. In an article from the Humanist magazine titled The Never-Ending Fight in the March-April 1989 edition, this is what Asimov states, and these are his words. In addressing the humanists of 2089, and I'm sure there will be humanists in the world of 2089, if there should be indeed be a world in 2089, I would have to say this. Despite all the further advance of technology, despite the fact that we have computerized the world, despite the fact that robots are doing the menial work of humanity, and that human beings are freed to work creatively at human tasks, despite the fact that we have expanded to the moon and beyond, and are rapidly penetrating the solar system generally, and despite the fact that we understand the universe far better than we used to in a century, we used to a century ago, the vast majority of human beings still take solace and comfort in their various superstitions and still follow any Pied Piper who fills their ears with notes of nonsense while filling his or her own pockets with money. I'll say again, he wrote this in 1985. And we are still in the minority and still struggling to convince people that if indeed there were a God, they would, be, they would in the end reject anyone who failed to make use of that one truly godlike gift. But if, if this is so, and if we are engaged in a never-ending fight with no victory in sight, why continue? Because we must. Because we have the call because it is nobler to fight for rationality without winning than to give up in the face of continued defeats. Because whatever true progress humanity makes is through the rationality of the occasional in individual and because, of any, and because any one individual we may win for the cause may do more for humanity than a hundred thousand who hug their superstitions to their breast. And it is here that I want to mention that when Asimov died in 1992 at his memorial ser service, Kurt Vonnegut stood up and the first words out of his mouth were, we all know Isaac is in heaven now. Clearly being a humanist does not prevent one from being a wise guy. 
I also want to mention someone else who is a humanist who has had a lot of influence on my life and my life direction. That person, of course, is Gene Roddenberry. When he set out to create Star Trek, while the backdrop of the show was a Western in outer space, in fact, it's often been called Wagon Train to the Stars, and I think you have to be a certain age to kind of understand that reference. It became something more, even when he was putting the original series together. In an interview with the Humanist magazine in March, April of 1991, just a few months before he died, the interviewer asked him, his, asked him this question. Was there some pressure on you from the network to make Star Trek white people in space? Roddenberry's answer was, yes, there was, but not terrible pressure. Comments like, come on, you're certainly not going to have blacks and whites working together, that sort of thing. I said that if we don't have blacks and whites working together, by the time our civilization catches up to the time frame the series is set in, there won't be any people. I guess my argument was so sensible that it even stopped the zealots. Later in that interview, David Alexander, who was the interviewer, stated, Star Trek The Next Generation is probably the most humanistic entertainment program that is on television, or perhaps ever been on television. One of the underlying messages of both series is that human beings can, with critical thinking, solve the problems that are facing them without any outside supernatural help. Roddenberry's answer was, I've always thought that if we don't have supernatural explanations for all the things we might not understand right away, this is the way we would be. And it's with a touch of irony that he was an ardent humanist, and in Next Generation, he created a character that was godlike in powers that put humans on trial to help us live up to our best selves. He kind of had an answer for that, too. At the end of the interview, Alexander asked him, how is the Gene Roddenberry of today different compared to the Gene Roddenberry of 20 to 25 years ago? Roddenberry answered, he's a more educated man. There is a great deal of education in what I do. There are magazines and books that I read regularly and a process of education that I dearly hope will continue. I like me now, which is a change from my mid-30s and 40s. Roddenberry also gave a vision of a future where many of the problems that persist now don't have to persist in future generations. This future optimism is not something that is pie in the sky. It is a future we all have to work for, be it boots on the ground, marching somewhere, sending postcards to remind people to vote, or phone banking to ensure an immoral law does not pass. I'm reminded of something that the Reverend Dr. William Barber once said. In March of 2015, I was lucky enough to get to go to the 50th, uh, 50th anniversary of the Selma March in Alabama. The Reverend Dr. Bar Barber gave one of the keynote speeches on the first day that I was there, and one of the things he said still sticks with me. He said to a room full of Unitarian Universalists, he said, it's our turn now. Martin ain't coming back, y'all. James Reeb cannot come back. Medgar can't come back. Elizabeth Stady, Katie Stanton can't come back. Harriet Tubman can't come back. But we are their children. And it's our time to focus on weightier matters of justice and compassion and faith. It's our time to take on the regressive public policies and the nightmares of extremism. It's part of our Unitarian Universalist faith that motivates us to create that future. For me, it's also my religious humanist theology that asks the same. UUism allows for this and many other philosophies to join together to create this, whether you call it beloved community, the kingdom of heaven on earth, or just making the world a better place for everyone. I leave you with this quote from Peter Sampson from his essay, Can Humanists Be Religious? And he says, yes, humanism can be religious, indeed, the most meaningful and livable kind of humanism is itself a religious way of understanding and living life. It offers a view of people and their place in the universe that is a religious philosophy. Overarching and undergirding it all, there can be a haunting sense of wonder, which never leaves one for whom life itself is a mystery and a miracle. Where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going with all of this effort, frustration, the grief, the joy. 
to be caught up in this sense of wider relatedness, to sense our being connected in live ways with the world and everyone in it, is the heart dimension of religion, whatever its name. So may it be. Our closing hymn today is hymn number 317, We Are Not Our Own. My closing words to you all today are by Andrea Hawkins Camper, and she says, may we see all as it is, and may it all be as we see it. May we be the ones to make it as it should be, for if not us, who? If not now, when? This is the, this is answering the cry of justice with the work of peace. This is redeeming the pain of history with the grace of wisdom. This is the work we are called to do, and this is the call we answer now, to be the barrier and the bridge, to be the living embodiment of our principles, to be about the work of building beloved community, to be a people of intention and a people of conscience. Now, ordinarily, I would just throw it to Alex for the postlude today, but I just wanted to say that um, I feel lucky that I have had the privilege to serve you all these last six months and the other congregations that I've had the privilege to serve have all had brilliant musicians. And I always like to ask them to play this one thing just to see if they can do it. It's um, one of my favorite pieces of uh, classical music. It's uh, Rhapsody in Blue by George Gershwin. And this is my parting gift to you all. Thank you very much.
On behalf of the congregation, I would like to thank the Reverend DeBeck for his service to us in the past six months and introduce the benediction that the choir has prepared in his honor.